but I'm delighted to, to welcome you um, this afternoon to a panel discussion on practical and theological responses to climate change. Um, and we have three uh, expert presenta presentations um, to feast on this afternoon, each of which will last for about 20 minutes. And then there'll be a couple of minutes for each of the panelists to respond to one another's paper. And then we will open it up to the floor for further discussion. So um, hold on to your questions from each talk and, and, and uh, until the end. Uh, so the, the first speaker this afternoon um, is going to be um, Anne Salma Dol Dolchis Ashley. And she received her BS and MS in biology from Georgetown University and her MDiv at Western Jesuit School of Theology. In 2011, she received a PhD in Moral Theology from this university, um, the University of Notre Dame, with a dissertation analyzing the Catholic sexual abuse crisis in the US. Of, and I would say, uh, just in passing, it's one of the most difficult um, problems to analyze. <laughs> uh, so a, a former campus minister with the Archdiocese, Archdiocese of Chicago and St. Mary College, she now holds a position as a postdoctoral teaching fellow in the Department of Theology at Notre Dame. Um, so the, uh, the title of her talk, I haven't got it on here. Oh, sorry. Is oh, American Nature Writers and Pope Benedict XVI's World Day of Peace message. So, so okay. okay. Thank you very much. Is your... Um, I think it is. Can you hear me? Well, okay. Thank you. So over to you, Alan Selma. Thank you. In this paper, I wish to utilize American nature writers in dialogue with uh, Pope Benedict's uh, writing on the environment to, um, uh, to s motivate conversation uh, at this university and within the Christian community in general towards um, environmental consciousness. According to the American Psychological Association, not to mention so many speakers who have come before me, Americans uh, appear to be stuck in a pattern of denial regarding responsibility for climate change. I believe our incapacity as a society to see and accept our culpability for environmental destruction also mirrors theologically an incapacity on the part of persons of faith to see and experience creation as a gratuitous gift of God in Christ, the basis of conversion, loving self-sacrifice, and communion. However, Pope Benedict XVI, now Pope Emeritus, who nearly, uh, during, during his nearly eight-year term as Bishop of Rome earned the moniker the Green Pope, uh, plumbed traditional sources of the faith in order to link Christian theology and doctrine more closely with the human place in the natural world. Among his many writings, Benedict's 2010 message for the World Day of Peace distills his eco-theology. But how do we, how do Catholics, or all Christians, or even the Notre Dame community, place ourselves in the natural world given our patterns of denial about what's going on there, and given our theological tendencies to think of salvation as applying to human persons seen somehow separate from nature? This is a question that uh, Celia raised uh, during her talk in the previous hour. I suggest that the distinctive genre of American nature writing might provide an interdisciplinary cultural resource for especially Americans who are Christian to develop positive responses to gratuitousness, identification of and contrition for culpable sinful actions, and a capacity to grasp the truth which liberates. And here I will correlate three, classic, uh, three such classic authors with Benedict XVI's environmental message. Narrative and other literary forms have the capacity to mold ethical conscience and assist in ethical decision making by means of inviting the reader into the place and space of the writer and of enabling the reader not only to see as the writer sees, but also to respond likewise. Non-academic literary genres examine levels of moral response, otherwise difficult to probe via rational argument, to push back moral horizons, contribute to the creation of social conscience, and expose the complexity of moral discernment. Classic nature writing confronts readers with the possibility of, in the words of Benedict, renewing and strengthening that covenant between human beings and the environment, which should mirror the creative love of God from whom we come and towards whom we are journeying. The writers I examine here are wilderness and national parks advocate John Muir, forester and environmentalist Aldo Leopold, and Pulitzer Prize winning author Annie Dillard. For the sake of brevity, I will be examining relevant selections rather than treating their work as a whole. 
and I do so in dialogue with Benedict XVI's World Day of Peace message. These writers do not offer blueprints for programs or policy or even with a general course of action in the manner of Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring, for example, but rather they summon readers into active participation in a real life ecological narrative. They place readers within view of their destiny for transformation, of which the concrete endings may be variable and only dimly perceived. And they confront persons with the challenges of living in communion with others the others being identified as both humans and non-human creation. For Benedict XVI, Benedict, excuse me, Benedict XVI cautions against a commitment to the environment and the natural world, which devolves into pantheism or a uh, neo-paganism, excuse me, or pantheistic nature worship, um, which often persons go towards, given the failures of humans uh, towards nature. He also cautions against taking cues solely from scientific analysis, although he says science is very necessary, just not sufficient by itself. Rather, such a commitment holds the promise of reconnecting our experience with the beauty of God's presence and goodness, and of placing our sinful destruction of creation and accompanying oppression of the poor under God's liberating truth and judgment. By articulating the truth and rejecting oversimplified and sentimental responses to the natural world, says Benedict, Christians, Christian communities may then, in an ongoing act of discipleship, engage willingly in practices of asceticism, which concretely reconnect their own lives and their environment with God's creative power and love. So the first, um, so that's Pope Benedict behind me in his garden, feeding the fish. This is the famous American uh, naturalist, John Muir. Um, the essay I'm examining is entitled The Hetch Hetchy Valley. It's the final chapter in his longer volume, The Yosemite, which was published in 1912. Muir died in 1914. And the Hetch Hetchy Valley represents uh, his last greatest uh, effort to, uh, to try to reclaim a, a piece of wilderness. Uh, in this chapter entitled The Hetch Hetchy Valley, he extols both the major glories and the finer sublime features of the region in and around Yosemite National Park. The valley, Hetch Hetchy Valley is located in the park. It's evidence that breathtaking beauty in nature, in creation, is no rare event. Muir observed, quote, Yosemite is so wonderful that we are apt to regard it as an exceptional creation, the only valley of its kind in the world. But nature is not so poor as to have one of anything, close quote. Indeed, the valley was a uniquely beautiful ecosystem within a granite canyon sustaining hundreds of animal species, as well as two of the highest waterfalls in the US. Yet after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and the devastating fires in its aftermath, public alarm for reliable supplies of water set in motion a process which dammed the Tolumne River in the valley, and it remains a reservoir to this day. Muir's prior success in advocating for and preserving large swaths of land he was instrumental in changing the idea of national parks into what it is today, a system of lands accessible to all rather than isolating Yellowstone as kind of the national park, lay largely in his uh, superior capacity to render into words that transcendent human response to the sheer beauty of nature. To be sure, conveying this experience is the bread and butter of all nature writers. Yet Muir was not only able to articulate more keenly than others, what goes on in the human spirit when confronted by nature's glories, but was also encountering some of the most spectacular natural scenery on Earth. Muir found, when confronted by the Hetch Hetchy Valley, that he responded in love and was drawn into communion, and he uses those words. Nature's beauty itself compels, calls, and attracts us. Its sheer loveliness gets through internal prejudices that see only inert stuff. Via the senses of sight, sound, and touch, the overall experience is one of transcendence that takes us out of ourselves. His handling of the matter does not facilely condemn the modern world's need for electricity and water utilities. He was not a neo-Luddite, but rather keeps the reader simply rooted in beauty, an experience which now brings grief. Quote, everyone needs beauty as well as bread places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and cheer and give strength to body and soul alike." Close quote. How can Muir's discourse dialogue with Benedict XVI and assist contemporary communities in their responses to climate change? 
like Muir, Benedict encourages direct experiences uh, in nature and direct experiences of nature surrounded by natural beauty. Words and exhortations are no substitute for getting outside. He echoes the understanding that creation's beauty alone is an object of contemplation, bringing an understanding of our proper human vocation and worth, as well as recognizing that the love, the, excuse me, recognizing the love of the creator which brought forth and continues to sustain such beauty. It is a very significant fact, says Benedict, that many people experience peace and tranquility, renewal and reinvigoration when they come into close contact with the beauty and harmony of nature. Indeed, it is from this existential experience of creation's beauty and harmony that the Judeo-Christian tradition began to recognize who God really is. The biblical God is not the God of the nations, that is simply the greatest being in the universe. God, the author of creation, is paradoxically wholly other and different from creation, and therefore unable to be pinned down and manipulated by the limited concerns of human beings. The paradox continues in that this God, entirely different from the material world, also remains in close proximity. God is relational, ecstatic, fecund, alive as passionate love, offering us the gifts of creation for our free use that we might respond in love and gratitude. Reflection upon natural beauty and creation leads Christians <clears throat> inexorably to the triune God whom we encounter in the economy of salvation calling us into right relationship with, God's, with God and God's gifts. As Benedict notes, contemplating the beauty of creation inspires us to recognize the love of the creator, that love which moves the sun and other stars. Is it not true that nature in a cosmic sense has its origins in a plan of love and truth? The world is not the product of any necessity whatsoever, nor of blind faith or chance. The world proceeds from the free will of God he wanted to make his creatures share in his being, in his intelligence, in his goodness. And finally, Muir's writing exposes the simultaneously disordered and well-intentioned practices and attitudes of persons in regard to the natural world, which have led to environmental catastrophe. Benedict notes, yet no, let troubling, yet no less troubling are the threats arising from the neglect, if not the downright misuse of the earth and the natural goods which God has given us. And he takes this up into an advocacy for the poor, which I will treat at the end of my talk. Okay. My second author, Aldo Leopold, Thinking Like a Mountain. Leopold's essay, entitled Thinking Like a Mountain, I just wanted to make sure it was there, um, is about five pages long. It's in a collection, sketches here and there, placed immediately after the almanac section of his celebrated uh, Sand County Almanac, published in 1949. The piece consists of an extended metaphor or parable based upon real life experience. The value of metaphor lies not in mathematical or philosophical precision, but rather in its attuning our knowledge, awareness, and responses to the truth, often in unexpected, surprising, or ironic ways. Metaphor ingeniously conveys uh, complex or paradoxical truths and captures our curiosity by a cognitive dissonance for which the human brain naturally seeks resolution. Yet by challenging us with a metaphor, neither does Leopold give us marching orders, but rather instead a vision of reality upon which we must base our ethical decisions and actions, and a pattern we need to detect and follow in different but analogous circumstances. Rather than lapsing into rigid moralism or fanciful sentimentality, Thinking like a mountain inexorably leads to a profound internal conversion, achievable only by the humbling experience of contrition for sin. The essay describes an encounter of the young Leopold, then a surveyor for the newly formed United States Forest Service um, with a wolf pack in New Mexico. When he and his team saw the pack, they just automatically opened fire. Um, he says, we didn't think twice about it. We just picked up our guns and started shooting. Fortunately, there was kind of an overhang of a rim rock that kept them from completely annihilating the pack. But Leopold writes, quote, we reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. 
Just as in Genesis 3, the Lord called to the man and woman in the cool of the evening, the dying wolf called out to Leopold and his eyes were opened as hers shut permanently. The remainder of the essay expresses a sorrow he held for the rest of his life. Ecosystemic destruction for both deer and for humans spiraled out of control as every state in this country exterminated its wolves, a keystone predator. He wrote, I have seen every edible bush and seedling browsed, first to anemic desuetude and then to death. I have seen every edible tree defoliated. In the end, the starved bones of the hoped for deer, dead of its own too much, bleach with the bones of the dead sage." Close quote. In our hubristic quest for security, he says, too much safety seems to yield only danger in the long run. The goodness of God's natural creation from the mountain itself housing all kinds of living things to the wolf family got fulfilling God's command to produce offspring has taken a back seat to humanity's shadow creation of technological dominance. Benedict's thought echoes this idea when he writes, the true meaning of God's original command, as Genesis clearly shows, was not a simple conferral of authority, but a summons to responsibility. The wisdom of the ancients, and now Leopold's wisdom through hard experience, recognizes that nature is not at our disposal as a heap of scattered refuse. Everything that exists belongs to God, who has entrusted it to man, albeit not for his arbitrary use. Once man, instead of acting as God's co-worker, sets himself up in place of God, he ends up provoking a rebellion on the part of nature, which is more tyrannized than governed by him." Close quote. And that, of course, echoes John Paul II's thought, as Celia pointed out. Catholics informed by the sacraments understand contrition as a sorrow for sins. Without confronting the painful truth of our willful separation from God, penance cannot heal. In this story, Leopold's contrition for his wrongful action led him actually not directly to mount a campaign to save the wolves, as it were, but more broadly and deeply to a new excuse me, epistemological level, that is, thinking like a mountain. He invites us rather compellingly to, through his own experience to a change of mind and heart, thought and motivation manifest in that phrase. Leopold's thinking like a mountain expresses a great love for the land, itself now understood as living and non-living things occupying key niches and offering to Leopold the possibility of coexistence. In his guilt and regret, he experiences a love whose first expression is the sorrow that he personally is culpable for contributing to the land's devastation. And I'll just mention Dan Castillo's presentation earlier today on sorrow and lament here. That's Aldo Leopold, okay. All right, my third author um, is Annie Dillard. Uh, her 1978 book, Holy the Firm. A very short uh, creative nonfiction work, Holy the Firm is only 76 pages. It recounts Dillard's journey of faith as her interaction with nature leads her to difficult questions regarding uh, creation's overpowering beauty and destructive power alongside human fragility and seeming insignificance. She decided to recount whatever transpired during three sequential days from her home on an island in Puget Sound. On the first day, she exudes, all day long, I feel created, that's a quote. She elegantly names all things she sees, the sea, the birds, the air, the cascade range to the east, as gods, but not in the pantheistic way that Benedict condemns, rather in the manner of Psalm 8, uh, so wondrous, so beautiful, so full of life that words referencing anything than the divine fall short. On the second day, she hears the sound of a light plane taking off and then impossibly the silence of a failed engine. The plane falls to the ground. Its two occupants escape with their lives, but quote, the fuel exploded and little Julie Norwich, seven years old, burnt off her face, close quote. The catastrophe sends Dillard into a dizzying free fall of Job-like questioning of God's goodness and justice and the meaning of a creation where without warning the, the face of an innocent child can be burnt off. In a manner reminiscent of the Psalms of Lament, Dillard confronts the truth of the moment. God is, quote, abandoning us to time, to necessity, and to the engine of matter unhinged, close quote. She conveys the hopelessness of reality, quote, one Julie, one sorrow, one sensation bewildering the heart, 
and enraging the mind and causing me to look at world self appalled. She says in her rational mind that she knows that God is all good. And I take it also as given that whatever he touches has meaning is only, if only in his mysterious terms. The question is then whether God touches anything. Is anything firm or is time on the loose? Close quote. Does God really hold us in the palm of his hand or are such lovely words only the voice of the desperate, unable to see their existence as some kind of cruel joke? The second half of the book takes on this delusional cast as Dillard struggles to make sense of her ordinary daily life now upended by the terrible accident. In contrast to Muir, where creation's beauty manifests love, bounty, and communion, Dillard's story confronts and probes the harsh alternative. Nature has presented undeniable evidence that maybe God isn't so gratuitous after all. Maybe God is more like a capricious tyrant overwhelming our small world with sheer power and enormity. Her rejection of easy answers does her readers a service. She helps us confront the truth that there are no deceptive consolations here. Because nature can cause such pain, human persons often seek technological ways to control it. But Pope Benedict urges us to understand technology properly, not to take the place of God, but rather to orient us F back to God. Ultimately, even technological solutions will fail. What climate change shows, in fact, is that we are not God. We can't control everything to suit our desires. What do we do then? Notes Benedict, quote, technology is never merely technology. It reveals man and his aspirations towards development. It expresses the inner tension that impels him gradually to overcome material limitations. Technology, in this sense, is a response to God's command to till and keep the land that he has entrusted to humanity. And it must serve to reinforce the covenant between human beings and the environment, a covenant that should mirror God's creative love. Dillard, a Christian, knows that God's creative love is nowhere more expressed than in the person of Jesus Christ. She begins to recognize in this tragic act of nature her own calling as a Christian, not to dominate the environment, but to be Christ to others. She willingly, at the end of the book, takes upon the heart-wrenching questions, existential pain, and threat of meaninglessness, which seems to be Julie's fate, upon herself. And this, not motivated by heroism, but simply out of love. Like Job in the Old Testament, who puzzlingly receives not an answer from God, but rather an encounter of God's presence via the awesome beauty and mysterious powers of nature, Dillard encounters not an answer, not even justice, but communion. This not from an exalted, incomprehensible God living above the clouds with all the answers, but emerging from within her own heart as God's own grace enables her to make a gift of self to Julie. Within the context of nature that is so dangerous, it seems to limited human minds that the only morally responsible course of action is to tame it and control it. Dillard does not give in to the temptation to play God, but rather ends up encountering God. From the perspective of faith, notes theologian Gustavo Gutierrez, Job's own wrestling and lamenting keeps him tied to the awful truth of his situation, but this truth eventually leads him to another truth, the truth of contemplation. Our calling as Christians is revealed in and through the natural world, which demonstrates a glorious, if frightening, opportunity to be part of that creation, reconciled to God through the cross, and enters lovingly into a relationship of, the, of communion with the Julie Norwiches of this world. Okay, now going back here a bit. We'll go back to Pope Benedict. By way of conclusion, I would be remiss if I did not make some kind of brief reference to the poor, to whom uh, Benedict XVI refers frequently in his 2010 World Day of Peace message. As we know, the poor often benefit the least from the material goods of creation, and yet the greatest uh, burden of the environmental crisis is often placed upon them. They are, for the human species at least, the canary in the coal mine. The poor, the suffering, the vulnerable can meaningfully be located right at the center of Christian encounters with the environment and Christian environmental ethics. Hence, Pope Benedict XVI's connecting sustainability 
with efforts on behalf of the human poor and vulnerable is no ordinary moral duty defined as a distinctively Catholic mark in environmental ethics, but expresses more broadly charity and truth. For Benedict, the poor disclose to us both the severity of God's judgment, God who is truth, and whose truth confounds human manipulation, as well as the tenderness and graciousness of a God ecstatically in love with all God's creatures. This severity and this tenderness are utterly unbearable apart from the grace and love, as Benedict would note, of that same God who, in the words of St. Paul, calls us out of darkness into his splendid light. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm now going to introduce our second speaker, Elizabeth Gropi, who's Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at Xavier University. She received her PhD here at Notre Dame, and she's author of the article, Climate Change, published by the Jesuit weekly America magazine, and a member of the Climate Change Task Force of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Um, and her title, um, today is on wisdom, exploring wisdom. So thank you very much, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and thanks to the organizers of this very important conference. It's a real um, pleasure to be here with you all. Um, scientists, as we have heard yesterday, have illuminated for us the biochemical causes of climate change and its projected consequences. It is then the responsibility of the theological discipline to take this causal analysis to another dimension, to probe the causes of climate change in terms of the human soul and psyche, human culture and society, asking the question, why? Why are we burning coal and oil, leveling forests and emitting chlorofluorocarbons and methane to such a degree that we are changing the climate in a manner that threatens the very existence of many species of life, including our own. The answers are complex and vary with context. When we began mining and burning coal at the onset of the industrial era, we could see in the soot-covered cities that, in the words of the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge. But we were ignorant, initially, of the fact that the invisible gas carbon dioxide that poured forth from coal burning plants and was accumulating, uh, was accumulating in the atmosphere and being absorbed in the oceans in a manner that would ultimately destabilize the climate and acidify the sea. As we discussed yesterday, there are people yet today who do not have an adequate scientific understanding of the ecological consequences of our actions. One cause, then, of our predicament is ignorance. The first realization that fossil fuel-fired industrialization would in time lead to changes in atmospheric gases and a consequent warming of the planet came in 1895. It was the insight of the Swedish chemist Savant Arrhenius who employed a spectrophotometer developed by Irish physicist John Tyndall to measure the absorptive properties of gases. Arrhenius testified to the Swedish Academy that rising levels of what at that time was called carbonic acid would mean that future generations would live, quote, under a warmer sky. Arrhenius vastly underestimated the pace at which this warming would occur. It would, he thought, take 3,000 years of coal burning to double atmospheric levels of CO2. In fact, it appears it will only be 240. Arrhenius' study of atmospheric CO2 was reengaged in the 1950s by Charles David Keeling, who developed a new technique to measure CO2 and began monitoring the gas at 1,000 feet above sea level in Hawaii, producing the graph we have seen many times on the screen, um, known now as the Keeling curve. Scientists 
using the research of Keeling and others, first testified to the United States Congress about the potential of climate change to threaten human well-being in 1979, and yet 34 years later, almost twice the lifetime of some of the students gathered here, we have yet to pass any significant climate change legislation, and one international convention after the other has ended in disappointment. Meanwhile, scientific projections about the dangers of climate change have become reality. A study conducted by the Global Humanitarian Forum estimated that climate change in 2009 was responsible for 300,000 deaths, the suffering of 325 million people, and economic losses of over $100 billion. Over 90% of those persons most severely affected were from developing countries that have contributed the least to global carbon emissions, including the people of the Carteret Islands featured in the film last evening. We cannot claim that this has happened because of our ignorance. Why then? Why have we disregarded scientific projections and then early warning signs and symptoms such that we now have a life-threatening planetary fever? Why are we like the smoker who, warned by a doctor that we have lung cancer, proceeds to double our consumption of cigarettes. The personal, cultural, and social dynamics behind our self-destructive behavior are complex and multiple, and many have been identified by today's excellent speakers. These causes include a dysfunctional political system, an economic culture that deems rational decisions that serve the short-term self-interest of individual, individual actors rather than the planetary common good, and the subtle dynamics of moral corruption elucidated by Professor Gardner this morning. Also at play is the hubristic assumption that we are invincible and that human power and technology will ultimately solve any problems we create and conversely, the sense of powerlessness that many of us feel when we squarely face the reality of climate change, a helplessness and despair that can lead to psychic numbing. There are some people who have, as we heard yesterday, willfully distorted scientific evidence, but there are also people who truly desire to live in right relationship with creation and yet find ourselves trapped in structures we did not create but cannot readily change, like sprawling metropoli designed with the assumption of transport in private automobiles. Weep, said the desert father, Abba Poeman. Truly, he said, there is no other way but this. Whoever wishes to be liberated from sins, the desert father explains, is liberated from them by shedding tears. And whoever wishes to acquire the virtues acquires them by shedding tears. Sin, in the context of which the Desert Fathers wrote, Douglas Christie explains in his book, The Blue Sapphire of the Mind, was, quote, understood not primarily in terms of personal moral fault, although it sometimes had its proximate roots in such an experience, but rather as a fundamental condition of alienation that was reflected in both personal and communal reality. The language of sin enabled the monks to grapple with the fractured reality of their own lives and the life of the community and the world within which they live. It helped them to see and acknowledge the tear in the fabric of the whole." Unquote. In the accounts of the Greek monks, the tears of compunction come with penthos, a piercing of the heart that deepens the capacity for seeing, feeling, and responding to the world. In the Latin tradition, Augustine also spoke of a pierced heart in his reflections on his experience of a God whose love for us despite our sinfulness is manifest in the incarnation of the word of God and the paschal mystery. You have pierced our hearts, he wrote to God in his confessions, with the arrow of your love. With hearts broken open to this love of God, we can begin to face honestly the reality of climate change, probe its causes, and develop a response. Pope Benedict XVI identified one of the many root causes of global warming and the broader crisis of ecological degradation as our failure to respect the wisdom of the created order, which we have approached simply as a resource for our extraction rather than a gift that sacramentally bears witness to God. And uh, Matt Whelan alluded to this 
when, he's, when he talked about the language that even environmentalists have to talk about preservation of creation, talks about its importance for, um, for our own use. Um, the Natural Resources Defense Council has to use this utilitarian language um, to communicate in our culture about the value of the created world. In the remainder of my remarks, I will reflect briefly on the wisdom tradition and its contribution to the development of a theological response to climate change. The biblical texts that com comprise the corpus of wisdom literature portray, portray hokuma wisdom with an evocative array of rich images and metaphors. Rooted in the experience of daily life, the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, Wisdom, and Ben Sira date from the 6th through the 3rd century BCE and offer counsel for personal, familial, and social relationships embedded in reflection on nature and the cosmos. According to the book of Proverbs, wisdom is present at the beginning of creation. When God marked out the foundations of the earth, Lady Wisdom explains, I was beside him like a master worker. Because creation is made through wisdom, contemplation of the natural order can be instructive to human beings. The author of The Wisdom of Solomon, an anonymous Hellenistic Jew, was attentive to, quote, the structure of the world and the activity of the elements. The beginning and end of middle of times, the alternations of the solstices and the changes of the seasons. Ben Sira found wisdom not only in the diversity and order of creation, but also in the Torah given through Moses. And Jesus of Nazareth was deeply shaped by these wisdom traditions. The synoptic gospels attribute to Jesus over 100 wisdom sayings, and in Luke he is identified as someone with wisdom greater than Solomon. Passages in Matthew, notes biblical scholar James Dunn, suggest that Jesus is not simply a teacher of wisdom, but wisdom incarnate. This comes to full expression in the Gospel of John, where Jesus is identified as the incarnation of the Logos through whom creation was made. Yet God's wisdom, according to Paul, is a secret wisdom. The Greeks judged God's wisdom to be folly, for, Paul explains, it is the wisdom of the cross. In a culture in which maintaining one's public honor was of supreme importance, Christ underwent a humiliating death for the sake of others, and in so doing, he became, quote, for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The Christian theological tradition carries forward scripture's sapiential tradition. God's wisdom, according to Thomas Aquinas, is the exemplar through which the universe is created and the law that leads creation teleologically to its divinely intended end. St. Bonaventure approached creation as a mirror of the divine and believed that every creature has, quote, nothing less than a representation of the wisdom of God. I am wisdom, God said through the mediation of the Benedictine prophetess Hildegard of Bingen. I quickened all things with my breath so that not one of them is mortal in its kind, for I am life. This biblical and theological vision of a created order permeated by God's wisdom, however, was challenged deeply by modern scientific developments, particularly the theory of evolution of species through random genetic mutation, competition, and natural selection in the context of the geophysical forces of earthquakes, volcanoes, falling asteroids, and climate change. Blind to good and evil, the philosopher Bertrand Russell commented, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. Whereas classical Christian theologies of wisdom, such as that of Aquinas, depict a cosmos in which everything is created with an order and purpose that shapes the moral fabric of the universe, Evolutionary science challenges these teleo teleological assumptions. According to Nobel laureate and physicist Steven Weinberg, quote, we do not find any point to life laid out for us in nature, no objective basis for our moral principles, no correspondence between what we think is the moral law and the laws of nature of the sort imagined by philosophers from Plato to Emerson. Today, important work is being done to bridge the disciplines of theology and science by many scholars, including our previous speaker and, and moderator in this session, Professor D Dean Drummond. John Hout responds to the challenge posed by the tremendous scope of death and suffering inherent in the ev evolutionary process with an eschatological theology. 
Anglican theologian Sarah Coakley has worked closely with Harvard's Program for Evolutionary Dynamics to gain an in-depth understanding of research on evolution that has led Program Director Mar Martin Nowak to the conclusion that cooperation is as important as mutation and selection in evolutionary process. It is only after a period of stable cooperation, Nowak explains, that breakthrough moments in evolution, such as the development of multicellular organisms from individual cells, occur. And Nowak has developed mathematically precise accounts of these mechanisms of cooperation and their recurrent evolutionary patterns. And this, Coakley comments, quote, gives the lie to recent cultural mythologies of evolution, which are wholly determined by selfishness and violence on the one hand and erratic randomness on the other. Of course, she continues, competitiveness is at the heart of natural selection. There is no attempt to deny that here. But we now understand that there is also another principle at stake, that it, alongside mutation and selection in the full spectrum of evolution, one that it is not inappropriate to call productively sacrificial, unquote. These developments open up new possibilities for conversation between evolutionary science and the Christian wisdom tradition. Today, one can also find echoes of the tradition's affirmation that there is a wisdom to be found within creation among those working to address environmental degradation and the climate crisis. Practitioners in the fields of sustainable agriculture, ecological design, and biomimicry describe their efforts in a manner that resonates with Christianity's affirmation that the wisdom of the triune God is reflected in the created order. Although practitioners in these fields do not expressly give their work a theological interpretation, their witness makes an important contribution to an exploration of the contemporary meaning of the wisdom tradition in our time of climate crisis. Let us consider first an example from agriculture. The agricultural sector is responsible for an estimated 37% of U.S. carbon emissions. Tilling land to plant annual crops releases carbon from the soil, and carbon dioxide and methane, methane gas are emitted by farm machinery and livestock. Cornell University ecologist David Pimentel estimates that the industrial agriculture uses 10 kilocalories of hydrocarbon to produce just one kilocalorie of food. Moreover, the dominant forms of agriculture practiced in America today erode soil, deplete fertility and biodiversity, and require large amounts of hazardous pesticides and herbicides. On a small surviving patch of Kansas prairie, Wes Jackson glimpsed the possibility of a new agricultural paradigm. Westward moving American immigrants from Europe plowed up the prairie to plant the annual grains that are now the staple of our diet, acting on the assumption that nature's bounty was endless. Today, in a region where prairie once covered 85% of the land, only one-tenth of 1% 1 of the prairie remains intact. Jackson developed a deep affection for this remnant, cultivating what he terms a conversation with the land. And through this conversation, he learned that prairie systems are composed of perennial plants whose vast root systems build soil and sequester carbon dioxide. New growth springs from the roots each year such that plowing and planting is unnecessary and the land is never exposed to the eroding force of wind or heavy rain. When rain does come, the intricate horizontal spread of dense roots that have had many years to mature are able to make optimal use of the water. And in times of drought, like we experienced in this region last summer, the vertical depth of the root systems can find water at depths of 25 feet. In the richly diverse mature prairie, as many as 250 varieties of plants may coexist in a synergy that provides defense against blights and pest infestations. The prairie in its wisdom builds topsoil, cultivates biodiversity, and generates abundant fecundity using the energy of the sun. The dominant forms of American agriculture are the antithesis of this natural prairie system. And Jackson began to imagine what agriculture might look like if humans took instruction from natural systems. Essentially, he explains, we have to farm the way nature farms. He and his staff at the Land Institute in Kansas are in the process of perennializing wheat, sorghum, and sunflower, cultivating these plants in polycultures. 
If their humble emulation of a prairie's wisdom can be carried forward in quick order on a large scale, it will make a major reduction to the reduction of atmospheric CO2 and the prevention of famine. While Wes Jackson has been carefully observing prairie systems, architect Bill McDonough and chemist Michael Braungart have been re-envisioning human industry and civilization in the conviction that we must, quote, follow nature's design framework. They describe industrial civilization as a process in which humans have imposed through, through control and force our own designs on nature, and they call for a radically new paradigm for industry and civilization. Turning to nature for, inspira for inspiration, they describe themselves as humbled by the complexity and intelligence of nature's activity. Like the book of Proverbs that counsels go to the ant, consider its ways, and be wise, they hold up the industrious social insect as a model for our emulation. The cumulative biomass of ants is greater than that of humanity, but with very different consequences for the biosphere. Industrial homo sapiens put billions of pounds of toxic material into the air and erode cultural and biodiversity. Leafcutter ants, in contrast, enhance the ecosystems of which they are a part. In the process of collecting matter from the Earth's surface and carrying it down into their colonies to feed the fungal gardens that provide their communities with food, they aerate the soil and transport minerals needed by plants and soil microbes, contributing to soil health and fecundity. The cherry tree, another source of inspiration to McDonough and Braungart, sequesters carbon, produces oxygen, cleans air and water, creates and stabilizes soil, and provides habitat for a diverse array of species and food for microorganisms, insects, and animals. This architect and chemist team conclude that it is, it is not precisely the fittest, but the fittingest who thrive in natural systems by living within, quote, an energetic and uh, and material engagement with place and an interdependent relationship to it." Unquote. Can we design a building like a tree, a factory that operates with the effectiveness of an ant colony? Yes, they maintain, if we transform our basic mode of relationship to the earth from one of control through, through brute force to one of engagement and participation in earth's natural energy flows and nutrient cycles. Human systems, they maintain, must be designed like natural systems to live on current solar income, cultivate diversity, and cycle all nutrients such that what appears to be the waste of one process becomes food for another. And they have tried to put these principles into practice in several projects, including an uh, environmental studies building at Oberlin College and a textile factory in Germany. Their vision for a new form of human relationship with the earth is comparable to that of Janine Benyus, who coined the term biomimicry in 1990. This term, she explains, refers to the emulation of nature. She believes that by valuing the designs of nature that, we have, that have the wisdom of 3.8 billion years of evolutionary experience, humanity can learn to re-inhabit the earth in a way that leads to life's flourishing rather than its demise. Of particular importance for climate change is biomimicry's potential to inspire new forms of energy production based on study of the manner in which plants and bacteria photosynthesize energy from the sun in a manner far more efficient than our most sophisticated solar technologies. At Arizona State University and the University of Toronto, teams of chemists are working on trying to replicate the way that bacteria uh, execute photosynthesis. We peered over nature's shoulder, J. Devins Gust explains, tried something and peered over nature's shoulder again. One of the striking features of the literature on the emulation of nature is the occurrence of theological terms. We must act, writes Benyus, with the humility and the spirituality that are needed to take our seat at the front of nature's class. We must design with nature's wisdom, becoming students of nature rather than its conquerors. Marveling at the intricacies, effectiveness, and poetry of nature, she writes that biomimics develop a high degree of awe, bordering on reverence. The insights of those emulating the generative intelligence of nature may help us to hear again, in a new voice, the wisdom of the ancients to which Pope Benedict appealed, um, as Anselma noted in her remarks, that recognize that nature is not simply a heap of scattered refuge, but a gift 
of the Creator, who gave it an inbuilt, or, inbuilt order and enables us to draw from it the principles we need to till it and keep it." Unquote. And yet, the 21st century search for wisdom in the natural order is complicated by the fact that nature no longer exists as an order untouched by humans. As we noted yesterday, the epoch of geologic time in which we now abide is aptly termed the Anthropocene, because humans have so fundamentally changed the biosphere. At the very time that humans are beginning to recognize anew that there is wisdom and intelligence to the created order that is worthy of our emulation, we are degrading and diminishing that order. A once exquisitely diverse and beautiful coral reef that is now a lifeless skeleton in the waters of an acidified ocean reflects to us not the wisdom of the triune God, but the folly of humanity. Given these realities, a theology of wisdom fitting to our time impels us to sacrificial action on behalf of life. It is the theologian's vocation to speak as truthfully as possible about God, which cannot be done if the mirror of creation in which Bonaventure countenanced a reflection of the divine artist has been cracked and fractured. With the extinction of species and the despoiling of places, writes Willis Jenkins, we lose the ability to name and praise God. The terrible paucity we are threatened by in ecological degradation is the loss of that by which to bless God, and so the increased likelihood of idolatry." Unquote. St. Paul found wisdom in the crucified Christ, who appeared as foolishness to the Gentiles, the Christ who cried out in lamentation, let this cup pass, and then sacrificed his life upon the cross. Christian discipleship, John Sabrino writes, from among the suffering people of El Salvador, requires those of us with privileged lives to take the crucified people down from their crosses. In a world in which all of creation is groaning, discipleship today, as we heard earlier this morning, also means acting on behalf of all of God's threatened creatures. This discipleship can take many forms. We will hear momentarily about the efforts of the Catholic Climate Coalition and the St. Francis Pledge. Margaret File, a professor of ethics here, describes um, a liturgical asceticism in which the Eucharistic experience of communion with God through the Spirit of Christ bears fruit in disciplines such as energy conservation. Anglican bishops in England this year publicly gave up eating meat, not just on Fridays, but during all of Lent, and invited others to do likewise, a spiritual practice that is significant in light of the UN report, Livestock's Long Shadow, that found that live, the livestock industry is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all forms of transportation combined. People of faith are also working for public policies to address climate change and support the transition to carbon-free sources of energy. Professor Archer noted that we already have the technology for the various wedges needed to reduce CO2, but we lack the political will to put this technology into action. Given the dysfunction of our political system has manifest thus far in response to urgent scientific warnings about climate change, the necessary transformation of public policy will not be easy. It may well require sacrifice and public nonviolent action. Matthew Whelan spoke eloquently this morning of Sister Dorothy Stang and hundreds of others whose names are unknown to us who were steadfast in their work to protect the Amazon rainforest from illegal logging, despite repeated death threats, and ultimately gave their lives for the forest and the people who live there. In Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Washington, people have been engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience to halt plans to construct the Keystone Pipeline. In the state of New York, people are blocking with their bodies equipment used in hydraulic fracking for natural gas, or taking out second mor mortgages on their homes to finance work to protect the integrity of the Earth's water and underworld. Some of the forms of public action to address the moral urgency of conversion from fossil fuels that I have witnessed can be strident or polarizing in their tone. Catholics can contribute greatly to the common good by acting publicly for changes in energy policy in a distinctively Catholic way, that is, with a witness that is deeply prayerful and that testifies to God's beauty and love for all creatures. Why is it, the leader of a major international climate action organization re recently asked, that we do not yet have an environmental movement capable of affecting the necessary changes in public policy? 
Well, the problem, he concluded, is that we have not had a clear enemy to organize against, and we must name that enemy, and then we can galvanize against them. And this enemy, he concluded, is the fossil fuel industry. Psychologically, it is true that opposition to an enemy can bind humans together in action against a common threat. But theologically, there is a deeper truth, and that is that we are all, all of us, sinners, bound together in the heart of God's love and grace. And we realize our vocation to communion not by pointing our fingers at someone else, but in the transcendent moment of lifting our voices together in lamentation and praise of God. The Catholic Church played a leading role in organizing nonviolent action rooted in the spirit of love in the Solidarity Movement in Poland during the years of Soviet hegemony and in the resistance to the election fraud of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. The Church can again take that leadership in organizing nonviolent action calling for a transformation of public energy policy. As Orthodox theologian Elizabeth Theo Kratov notes, this church, the church should not be politicized or turned into an environmental organization. But the church must be the church, the mystical body of Christ, a sacrament of salvation in a public way. Imagine, if you would, that Notre Dame's campus, or the campus from which you traveled to this conference, was surrounded by people bearing, armed, uh, bearing assault weapons. We would not then go on with the business as usual that Daniel Castillo spoke about this morning. We would not hold classes or convene committee meetings or sit at our desk writing book reviews, but we would take action to disarm those threatening the campus and to protect life. There is, as a matter of fact, something threatening the lives of our students, and that, as we know, is climate change. Universities are addressing this threat with conferences such as this one and with the scholarship and research that is essential to a wise response to the crisis. But scholarship alone has not proven sufficient to affect change. There are over 200 Catholic colleges and universities in the United States. I conclude with a proposal. What if the presidents of all of these institutions suspended business as usual in recognition of the moral urgency of climate change, and canceled classes, declaring a period of public fasting, prayer, and nonviolent action in support of national climate legislation. Sarah Coakley, the Anglican theologian whose work with Harvard evolutionary scientist Martin Nowak I mentioned earlier, writes that phenomena such as the sacrificial practices of social insects may provide, quote, a sort of evolutionary preparation for a higher and fully intentional human altruism that can arise only when the cultural and linguistic realm is reached. Evolution, she concludes, delivers to us humans, made in God's image, the greatest possible inheritance of a responsibility. To crown those regular intimations of evolutionary cooperation, long established and refined, with acts of intentional sacrifice that alone can save the planet. Thank you. Okay, um, well now I'm going to move to our, our third speaker in the panel. And uh, at the end of this, I suggest we just have a couple of minutes break for those who need to use the restroom or whatever, because these papers are slightly longer than originally anticipated. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll now introduce our, our third speaker, who's Daniel Misley, and he's served at, at the, as the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Director of Diocesan Relations for the Department of Social Development and World Peace. He has trained Catholic leaders around the country in the principles of Catholic social teaching, parish social ministry, and community organizing. As the executive director of the Catholic Coalition on Climate Change, he works to engage the American Catholic community in serious and sustained conversation about a Catholic approach to climate change, focusing on the promotion of the common good, the protection of poor people, and the exercise of prudence. So it's very fitting then that we have this paper as the final um, paper about practical and theological responses to climate change. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, I think, I think the intention of inviting me was to dumb it down a little bit, because um, I, I don't know why else they would have invited me, because I clearly am not in the same league as, as the, my colleagues to the right. But 
Uh, but what I think I can offer is some uh, ideas of how uh, we could approach this at a practical level um, and, and what the coalition tries to do. So what I'll, um, what I'll try to do is, is three things. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what the coalition is, just briefly, uh, what we try uh, to do, or who is the coalition, what we try to do, and then how we try to do that. And we do that through uh, at least three ways, vision, resources, and partners. Um, so the, uh, the coalition is actually a bunch of organizations. Uh, the, the ones in the upper left-hand corner are essentially our board or our steering committee. And on there you can see that the Catholic uh, Bishops Conference is part of that. They actually chair the board. So we're linked in with the Bishops Conference. That gives us a lot of legitimacy. Catholic Relief Services, Catholic Charities USA, the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, and you can, you can read the rest of them. We also have this Catholic Climate Covenant campaign, and that campaign has been endorsed by these additional organizations that you see there. Uh, the campaign has also been endorsed by six dioceses that are listed uh, on, the, on, the sh on the screen there, as well as uh, uh, I think there's 15 Catholic colleges and universities, a fairly famous one in the Midwest and Indiana is also part of that. Um, your institution, these institutions have endorsed the Catholic Climate Covenant, which I'll talk about in a minute, in an institutional way. So they're all trying in some fashion to do the five parts of the St. Francis Pledge, which is, will be unveiled in a, in a minute or two. So that's, that's who we are. Uh, we are all of these organizations trying to work on climate change in ways that make sense to our organizations. The coalition itself, you're looking at 50% of the staff uh, is here with you today. So we are actually very small. Uh, so we have to do our work through our networks. So we, we're a network of networks, essentially. Okay? Um, is that moving? I can't, I, I, I'm having it on my screen here, too, but it's on a different computer. Um, what we are, we're the retail operation. So we're trying to get this word out to parishes, to schools, to individual Catholics. Uh, and we, and our initial charge, and it still continues to be our charge, is, is fairly simple. It's to implement the statement by the bishops from 2001. Um, very few people know about that statement. It, if, it's, if Catholic social teaching is the best kept secret, this thing is buried deep under the pile of that best kept secret because not many people know about it. But, but it, really is a, it really is a phenomenal document for, for our use. You may quibble with some of the language and some of the things that the bishops have said uh, in that document, but they essentially are trying to highlight three key thing, themes, prudence, poverty, and the common good. So. Um, uh, Dr. Dean Drummond uh, talked a little bit about prudence. The, what, what they're trying to say is, look, we don't have to know everything with 100% certainty to know that we need to act. Uh, and this was in 2001 when the, I think it was the second uh, assessment, climate assessment from the IPCC was out. So even the certainty at that point was less than it is today, but even then the bishops are saying, we're accepting this science and therefore we ought to act with prudence. Poverty. Uh, it's not just about the environment, it's also about people. Uh, in, in Bali, when they had a, a, a climate change conference, there was an image, of, a, a picture in the newspaper of three guys dressed in polar bear suits, and it said, save the humans. And I think that's what, that's what we're about. I think we're, we're, we're not just about the environment, we're also about how do we take care of one another uh, in this environment. And then it's the common good. Clearly, there's nothing that's more common to us all than the air we breathe and the the atmosphere that surrounds us and the blanket that is known as the greenhouse uh, that keeps us uh, cozy and maybe sometimes a little too cozy. All right, we're making it too cozy anyway. So our role is to try to take these ideas um, that we've explored here today and yesterday and tomorrow uh, and other ideas and try to make those um, understandable for the average person in the pew. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, Bill Lease uh, did the, had this quote, these are just a couple quotes from the bishop's statement. Um, he said this this morning, at its, this is the bishop speaking in 2001, at its core, climate change, global climate change is not about economic theory or political platforms, nor about partisan advantage or interest, interest group pressures. It's about the future of God's creation in one human family. Uh, another quote, we accept the consensus uh, findings of so many scientists and the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as a basis for continued research and prudent action. 
that quote has gotten me out of more conversations with people who are skeptical or deny climate change uh, than any other quote that I've ever encountered because I simply say to them, uh, your argument seems to be not with me as someone who's trying to implement the Bishop Statement, but with the scientists. So I'm sure that when you convince the majority of scientists that the science that they're propagating is wrong, the bishops will probably pull this document down and maybe write something new. But for now, let's not argue about the science. Let's argue about what we do about it as people of faith. So that, that has been very, very helpful. But let me, uh, let me offer a, a, a little bit more of a vision and I want to I want to tell a couple of stories um, and um, try to uh, try to uh, give you an idea of how we try to approach this. So um, let me get back to the top of this here. So one of the things, as I said, the coalition tries to do is to get Catholics, and this is not in, in academic settings. This is parish settings. This is with youth groups and so forth. How do we how do we get them to think differently about the universe, our place in the universe, and about our place on the earth? So many of the talks this week um, have focused on um, you know, kind of higher um, thinking about the science and about the theology. We're trying to take that down to a level that people can, can relate to. And we have no qualms about borrowing from uh, all of the great work that's been done uh, today um, or, and yesterday. So what we want to, we want to encourage people, we want to try to get people to want to be engaged in this before we start asking them how they can be engaged in it. We're gonna provide the tools uh, when, they, when they get it and when they wanna be engaged, but we're, not, we're really trying to persuade, not beat people up about it. So um, here's a couple ways that we do that, and I'm gonna give you a couple stories and I'm gonna to try to pull them together. So the first story is about a favorite saint for most Catholics and actually for most people, St. Francis of Assisi, and I'll tell, say a little bit about Pope Francis in a minute, but shortly after his death in 1226, um, one of his earlier followers and his first biographer, Thomas of Salerno, was pulling together all these stories about St. Francis, and a lot of them were about the creatures that he encountered. And this is one of the stories, and I'm just gonna read it. So again, this is from Thomas of Salerno. He says, heading to the hermitage of uh, Gracio, blessed Francis was crossing the lake of, I'm not sure how to say this, Rieti in a small boat. A fisherman offered him a little water bird so he might rejoice in the Lord over it. The blessed Francis received it gladly and with open hands gently invited it to fly away freely. But the bird did not want to leave. Instead, it settled down in his hands as in a nest and the saint, his eyes lifted up, remained in prayer. Returning to himself as if after a long stay in another place, he sweetly told the little bird to return to its original freedom. And so the bird, having received permission with a blessing, flew away, expressing its joy with the movement of his body. So that's how the, the scholar says it. A Franciscan friend of mine was talking about this story and he said, um, his perspective was this. He said that, this, that the saint's followers knew that their leader would regularly go into these trances so they told the fisherman, hey, give Frankie here a duck and watch what happens. And so they nudged each other with a wink and a nod, you know, and then uh, sure enough, Francis was taken by this little bird and the beauty of this particular gift of creation and he welcomed the bird and the bird felt safely in his hands. The union of the creature and the human transformed Francis to some other place and some other time. When he came back, both the duck and the man felt it was time to part ways, and the bird did so happy for the encounter. The fisherman and Francis' followers were smiling and saying to one another, see, I told you so, but the story did stick, and one of his followers decided to write it down. So the, note here that there's no possession. Francis neither took the bird for a pet or for lunch. It was simply an appreciation of this creature at this moment. There's one more story I think that is very familiar to all of us, and I think it relates to our work in, in a significant way. And of course, it's the story of, in the Gospel of Matthew of Jesus feeding the 5,000 people. And you know the story. After a long day of preaching to thousands of people and healing many others, Jesus' followers were urging him to knock off for the day and to find a place to, to and send the crowds away so they can get their dinners. And Jesus said, well, why don't we, cons why don't we feed them? Well, how come we're not doing this? And they said, look, all we have are five loaves of bread and two fish, clearly not enough for 5,000 people. 
Jesus was undeterred, and he blesses the food and had his disciples share it with a the crowd. Then Matthew says, they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over, and it was filled 12 wicker baskets. So although Matthew doesn't describe the miracle this way, I think Jesus was saying, look, we have enough. There's plenty. The problem is not that there's enough. The problem is that everybody else in this place is hoarding, hoarding bread and fish under their robes. And if we demonstrate in this ridiculous fashion that we can feed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, watch what happens. So my question is, have we really, as a Catholic community, as a Christian community, have we really tried to feed all the people with what we have? It seems to me there is enough, and, but we just don't share. If we begin to share, will others loosen up? That's a good question. And think of the implications uh, of this story if every Christian in the world truly lived it out, truly shared. Think of how transformative that would be. Stories matter, Number and st numbers and statistics matter, and the awfulness of climate change and environmental injustice only go so far. Guilt is a motivator, and it works well with Catholics, we'll all admit to that, but eventually you have to tell a story. Eventually you have to tell people in a powerful image, a metaphor, a story, or a ritual, a way forward. How do we move forward? For the faith community, we've got a pretty good set of stories and metaphors and art and ritual, and we can use these to inform us how we ought to act in the world in this time and in this place with this threat. The deep connection that Francis had with nature uh, is, is attainable by all of us, whether you're a member of the, an environmental organization or the Catholic Church. All we need to do is hold it, admire it, love it, and then let it go with the gratitude that we had that moment. These moments and these stories transform lives and create saints. And in my travels within the Catholic community, there are plenty of saints. Is there an urgency to what we're trying to do? Yeah, there is. But look at the sunnier side and let, us, let that motivate us, collectively as a Catholic community or a community of goodwill, to keep us moving forward. We have enormous assets in, the, in our church. If we can channel them in this direction, we can make a better world. Consider, for example, our size. Uh, you'll see that um, if, if, uh, if the Catholic community is 70, about in the United States, is about 75 million people, about 22% of the population. If we motivated just 5% of them to act on environmental justice issues, that's 3.75 million people. Looking at one of the largest environmental groups in the United States, the World Wildlife Fund, their membership is 1.3 million people. With a tiny fraction of our membership, we're already three times larger than they are. So we've got, we've got, the, we've got the capacity, or at least we've got the potential, I would say, to do that. We have 6,500 elementary schools. We have 2,000 high schools, 19,000 parishes, 200 and something colleges and universities. We have the largest private health care system in the country. We have the lar largest private nonprofit um, uh, charitable organization in the country, Catholic Charities USA. We have the largest relief and development organization in the country in Catholic Relief Services. There are over, th with Catholics and other churches combined, there are over 330,000 buildings, church buildings, religiously owned buildings. Um, in the country. If each of these decreased their consumption by 5%, think of the witness, think of the, I don't know what that number is, but it's a big one. Um, so I think we have, we have that ability to do this. So how are, we, how are we as a Catholic coalition trying to make this happen? Let's see, make sure I'm on the right slide here. One of the ways is um, we, we've developed several years ago, four years ago now, the St. Francis Pledge to Care for Creation and the Poor. The full title is actually the Catholic Climate Covenant, the St. Francis Pledge to Care for Creation and the Poor, which is a lesson that you never develop a program by committee. Okay, that's the primary lesson, because um, that's what happens. Now, if, if, we were, if we were smart, we would have said the St. Francis Pledge to Care for Creation, the Poor, and, and, and Build Justice, or something like that, but we, we left out the justice part. We just have creation and the poor. But the, the Fr St. Francis Pledge, so it's a framework, it's a tool, it's a way for individuals, uh, parishes, schools, other organizations 
to, to embrace uh, a Catholic approach to dealing with climate change. And the pledge is really five things. It's to pray and reflect about our duty to creation and the poor. It's to learn about Catholic teaching and climate change and educate others. It's to assess our own contributions to the problem. It's to act uh, to change those behaviors and our, and our choices. And then finally, it's to advocate on behalf of those without a voice. It's not multiple choice. If you take the pledge, you got to do all five. Uh, and then we ask that you, that you put your pledge on the website, um, on our website. So it's, it's a, again, it's a, it's a tool, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a program. The visual that you have there, this, um, we, we hired a, a consulting or a communications firm to help us develop this, and they came up with this, who's under your carbon footprint? This was, an, uh, when we launched this in um, April 21st, uh, of 2009, this ad was on the op-ed page of the New York Times. We got about 70 media hits all over the country for it. It was a big splash. Um, and we, we deliberately wanted to link the poverty and the climate change together. And we thought that this tag, who's under your carbon footprint, was a really smart way to do that. There's other, we have other um, similar visuals like as, as this, different, different pictures in the same, in the same um, tagline. Um, <clears throat> to date, uh, we have, when we first launched this, I thought within a year we'll have, you know, a million pledges. Well, we didn't quite get there. There's about 8,300 pledges. I guess it'll be about 8,350 when you all go home tonight and uh, sign the St. Francis Pledge. Um, and again, it's individuals, parishes, schools, parish, um, uh, or other organizations that have signed the pledge. We have 40 plus Catholic partners, which I showed earlier. We have six dioceses and archdioceses, and we have 15 Catholic universities. So it's, it's got a little bit of legs. We also have tried to do other things. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, had, we did with Catholic University and the Bishop's Conference last November was we held a, our own scholars conference on Benedict's teaching on the environment. And then Selma and Elizabeth were both part of that. Um, Daniel was part of that. Um, who else was there? Anyone else in the... Anyway, we had, we had a wonderful conference, um, I thought, and there's going to be a book about that that'll come out, um, I think, in the summer. So that's, you know, that, and we had, oh, we also had five bishops in attendance to that. So, it, you know, we were, we were able to, because it was linked to the bishops' conference, we were able to pull in some bishops um, there to that. Um, then uh, mentioned, uh, you, last night we showed the film Sun Come Up. We actually began a campaign with this last summer, and what we did was we, we, fed, we discovered this film, it's an uh, Academy Award nominated film called Sun Come Up, depicting some of the first climate refugees, the Carteret Islanders. Uh, they're off the coast of Bougainville, which is an island of Papua New Guinea. We got a grant to purchase 350 copies of the film. We sent it out to anybody who wanted it for free. Um, we, we developed um, three kits uh, to teaching. A, we developed a whole program around a two-hour program where, um, for, for colleges and universities, for parishes, uh, and for youth. And so we walked them through a process after they saw the film. What, what was your reaction? What do you think? And how can you, you know, become more um, aware of climate change? And how can you uh, implement some practices in your own life that, that help that? We estimate that about 20,000 or more Catholics saw the film over the course of about a month. We, we targeted the Feast of St. Francis last October, but it, some of them did it before, some of it did it after. We're gonna continue the campaign. This says April, we're gonna we're continue it for Earth Day. Hopefully we'll get a few more hits out of it. So we, we've sort of taken the Feast of St. Francis for ourselves. We've got asked no permission to do that, but now that's a big day for the, for the Catholic Coalition on Climate Change. And we're always trying to come up with ideas to help, to help move this agenda. Um, we have lots of other resources on our website. Um, we have a, a planning guide, how do you implement this at the parish level. Um, we have bulletin inserts, we've got prayers, we've got flyers, you know, we've got all the, all the bells and whistles. Uh, we're, we're working closely this year and last year with uh, youth and young adults. Uh, we have a program, a six uh, session program called Friending Planet Earth uh, that was developed for us by a youth ministry outfit. Um, the National Council of Catholic Women, one of our partners has a St. Francis uh, Care for Creation Award, um, get, urging schools to take the St. Francis Pledge, but then go above and beyond, and there's a competition, and they get a little plaque and all of that kind of thing. So it's small efforts. They're, they're modest efforts, but 
we're going to continue to try to plug away at this and, and try to make this more accessible to people at the, at the parish level. As far as I know, the Catholic Coalition on Climate Change is the only uh, national organization, I mean, in, there's no other uh, comparable organization, I don't think, in any other country to what we're trying to do. Um, I think that one, maybe Australia, I think there's Australia Earth Care, but they're structured a little bit differently. So we're excited about what we're trying to do. All of our partners, those 12 partners and others that you saw in the earlier slides, they're all trying to do some work on this. Um, and I think we're beginning to make a difference. We'll see. So thank you. Thank you, Mark.